And start with a prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to come together. We ask you, Lord, that as we come here this afternoon, to refresh us, to give us the wisdom and the understanding to see where you are leading and guiding us in our lives and to close her relationship with you. Help us to see how Mary stands as our image, our model, and our mother, leading and guiding us towards you, a closer encounter with Jesus Christ, her Son. We just ask you, Lord, to open up our hearts to receive more fully the spirit which you wish to give us. And we ask all this through Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. Well, welcome to the third session on Mary, as we're going through our deeper understanding of Mary. And now we're coming, last, the first class we talked about Mary as being Mary. Uh, Rose, can you turn the sound just a little bit? Yeah, just a little bit. There's a little bit of an echo. Sorry. I'm very sensitive to uh, sounds. They drive me nuts. They're off. It's a low ceiling. Yeah, it is low ceiling as well. Just a, just a tiny bit. Just kidding. So anyways, this third one, the first, the first one that we talked about was Mary as disciple, and what that term disciple actually means in terms of Mary being the model and image of what it means to be a disciple, which also means the bride. Um, we walk through, again, a comparison between Mary and the apostles of what an apostle does and what Mary's called, and what Mary shows us in terms of her actions versus the apostles, who more often not shows what not to do. Last week we talked about Mary and that title which she has, also referenced by St. Paul, talking about the new Eve as she stands the image module of the church, which is that's the new Eve. Mary shows us what that image of Eve also looks like in terms of also redemption as it's offered to femininity especially. What we're going to get into, t into today as we actually for the next four weeks as we go through these next four sessions on Mary and the dogmas and not just how these came out because you can look these up on pretty much Wikipedia and go through the history of how these things came about. Um, and so I, I'm going to go a little bit into the history of how these dogmas developed and why they developed to be the where they were. But really what I'm more interested in is, is showing the application of why these things really make a difference, if that makes sense. So maybe some of the things that we might be talking about today and actually the next couple of weeks, you might be familiar with some of these things if you've studied Mary before. But it also is showing the, the theological implications, which a lot of people don't always connect the dots. And so that's what I'm trying to do with these next four classes is maybe connect some of the dots as well as giving you an understanding of why this makes a practical difference in terms of Mary being mother, Mary being virgin, Mary being without sin, and Mary being ass assumed body and soul into heaven. <clears throat> and if you have any questions at all during this, during this time, just feel free to raise your hand. I'll be more than happy to answer. So Mary, as we've kind of discussed, Mary stands as an image and model of our relationship with God because Mary is the daughter of the Father. She is the spouse of the Holy Spirit. And she finds herself as the mother of the son, but the son who is the new Adam who comes to what? To raise her up. And so there's that level of equality. It's interesting. In the ancient Greek world, they had three different words for love. We usually use the word love one-dimensionally. as We just say, I love, I love, I love. But the Greeks would separate it into three distinct categories for love. The first one was called philia, friendship. The second one is called storge, which is affection. And the third type of love is called eros, erotic love. And so one of the ways in which, again, most people know what Eros, can usually t pretty much pretty quickly figure out what Eros is. It's the complementary love between the sexes usually is identified. Friendship, we all have friends and friends of this nature and things like that, but things that bind us in common to one to another. Storge is sometimes hard for people to understand until you understand in the context of family love, especially in the context of family, because you might, again, if you have siblings, again, you might not have anything in common with them. You might not have a very close friendship with them. And you obviously don't have an erotic attraction to them, or at least you shouldn't have an erotic attraction to a sibling. But what you do have is you have a very strong bond, a very strong bond where you find love, or you find support, or you find things. This was actually the ancient Greek understanding of what's referred to as storge, also called affection. One of the ways in actually you build affection is by proximity, placing yourself in proximity to, to people. First time you're around a person, you might not like them. Actually, the second time you might, longer you just stay in proximity to that person in the cubicle next to you, you really might not ever develop anything that you really share and do in common together, but you do develop an affinity towards them. So affinity, affection, storge. It's interesting because Mary will model all three. You'll find that Mary is what? Daughter of the Father. So it has that. Also spouse of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes and infuses life into her. And, there, and actually, in a very real sense, she becomes the spouse, which is an erotic type of love, but not an erotic in the way we understand it from a human way, but actually what you could call as a super eros, or what eros is meant to be. And then finally, you'll find that she is 
the new Eve, who, as, as with Adam, she becomes what? Friends. Jesus did not come to call us as slaves, but came to call us as friends. So you, actually, more often than not, most of our relationships in our life, most of the pains that we experience and the sufferings that we experience in our life is actually usually due to some type of flaw or some type of wound that comes from any of these three types of relationships. Family relationships, uh, lover relationships, or friendship relationships. Really, if you, we put into a category all of our relationships that we have as people, we usually can put, actually put almost every relationship into one of those three categories. It's also interesting because when we find that we are missing that, because I'd say that we have actually a fundamental human need to experience all three of those types of relationships, and we oftentimes don't. But see, what God desires is actually to meet us in all three of those areas of our life. And actually, the reason why people are able to enter into that is because they participate within God in moments, which is why if, that's ever, if one of those types of relationships is missing in a person's life and they feel a void, if they allow God to, God will come into it that and will actually satisfy. God wants to be our friend. God wants to be in that affection with us, and God wants to actually espouse us to himself. That's what he calls us as the church. The church, which is, as Pope Francis just recently, quoting the early church fathers, called that the church is the bride of Jesus Christ. To be a disciple is to be the bride. And so we see all three of these things patterned and modeled within actually Mary's relationship with God. And anything, like I said last time, about Mary's the new Eve, anything which is true of the new Eve, Mary, well, can also potentially true, be true about us as well. Does this make sense? Yeah. So, the first thing that major, major thing that happened in the early church, the first major conflict that Christianity came into, outside just the, the first initial conflicts they had with Jews, as Jews and Christians gradually became to separate, but especially when the Christianity went out into the world, and St. Paul started talking and evangelizing, especially the first place that they ended up in, as soon as they kind of left Israel, they went north, most of them went north, and they ended up in Turkey, and then they went right into, does anyone know? Greece. The, the seat of civilization, the seat of especially intellectual civilization, the of academia, of philosophy, of all these different things. So as they go into Greece, also if you understand Greece's history, Greece would have gone through the Hellenization process trying to make the entire world Greek. The entire world was highly influenced by Greece, most certainly intellectually. Intellectually, most of the intellectual movements had come out of Greece. Uh, Rome, even though Rome was the predominant military leader as well as the predominant culture at the time, Rome had pretty much taken a lot of Greece's culture, cultural elements as well as its intellectual elements and just pretty much adapted them. They didn't do a lot. They did some developments, but actually everything really for the most part came from Greece. And so at the time of the apostles, what the, what the Christians, especially St. Paul, as well as St. John, St. John especially, what they started encountering, and also I say St. John, because St. John is the last of the apostles to be alive. All the other apostles have been martyred at various periods. John is the only apostle that we know of that was not actually martyred. And so therefore, he is dealing with the later questions, later developments. And the first thing that actually the early Christians come into conflict with is a very popular Greek philosophy, which is actually still popular, although it doesn't go by this name anymore, but it's still popular in the world today. And the Greek philosophy is called Gnosticism. Gnosticism, which is a super spiritualism. Actually, if you want to look at modern day types of Gnosticism, New Ageism, which is not new at all, it's old, it's very old, um, which has hints of New Ageism has to talk a lot, especially about hidden wisdom, wisdoms, as well as energy lines and all these different types of things about energy and wisdom and secret knowledge and all these different elements that go into New Ageism which actually goes directly back into the ancient Greek world, especially this notion of what was referred to as Gnosticism. And this is actually what St. John writes his gospel predominantly as, a, as something to distinguish Gnosticism from Christianity. Because St. John's gospel, the gospel of John as well as the revelation of God, John looks very similar at times to Gnosticism. Actually, some of the early church fathers who were not as familiar with St. John and his gospel and his traditions, as well as his communities. Because St. John ended up kind of on the coast of Greece. If you know where Ephesus is, it's on the coast, just south of Constantinople, or where modern-day Istanbul is. So John ends up there. He also ends up in Patmos in the islands. 
And a lot of the communities were not really familiar with St. John, but St. John was very familiar with the Gnostics. And so, because there's a lot of similarities between Christianity and Gnosticism. There's actually a lot of them. Both of them talk about wisdom. Both of them talk about what's called logia, or wisdom, or logos, word, and things like this. Both of them, would they talk about a lot of the same things, but their beginning and ending point is going to be very, very different. Unless you really know Gnosticism, you really, it's sometimes difficult to understand and to see the difference between the two. But so, if you see any, this is all, this right here is modern day Gnostic uh, paint. If you've ever seen pictures like this on the web or you think people send things like this and it has this type of thing, this is usually, a, usually of, a Gnostic, of a Gnostic bent or of a New Age bent. Again, one of, the, one of the things about Gnosticism though, Gnosticism denied that matter, material reality, was good. They actually said that material reality was the source of evil. And they said that what? The real, where you find real goodness is within the spiritual realm, the ethereal realm, where you're not bound to form, where you're not bound to things like this, where it's, again, everything is loose. And therefore, every actually, all evil, all chaos, all things like this stem from, from material reality. Well, if you know anything about St. John's Gospel especially, you'll, you'll realize very quickly why this doesn't work because John, in his Gospel, focuses a lot upon that God became not just a body, but God became flesh. God took on material fleshly reality. In the beginning was the Word, in the beginning was the Logos, and in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, and the Word became and came down into flesh, John chapter 1. So when you look at that, this notion that God, who is the source of all goodness, which even the, the Gnostics would have actually believed in a type of God, not necessarily the God that we understand, but a type of God, more of an energy thing like this, but also which gave all wisdom, secret knowledge and things like this. When For the Gnostics, when they heard that God became flesh, this is totally antithetical to the Gnostic mind. That's not possible. It's not God, because God can't take on flesh, because flesh is the source of evil, and evil can't, if that makes sense. So, this is a huge point of contention, actually, in the early church, because a lot of people are being drawn into Gnosticism, and a lot of people are finding the similarities and thinking, oh, it's pretty much the same thing. And that's why the leaders of the church who really understand the deeper questions, especially St. John, writes big, huge, long discourses, which are found throughout, actually, his gospel, making sure you know the difference between Gnosticism and Christianity. Does this make sense? Yeah. And so, actually, because one of the things, one of the, the realities also of Gnosticism something which the Gnostics would permit and allow, because the flesh was evil, you, there was actually pretty much two, two reactions that you had when you dealt with fleshly material reality, which also included your body. Is that The one was that you denied everything about it. You went to one extreme. You denied everything about it. You became so stoic, or you became so repressed, or got rid of all, any type of fleshly desires, and you actually became cold and distant from the bodily reality. Anything that actually happened in material reality was irrelevant. So what was going on in politics, what was going on in your daily life, what was going on in finances, all these things were completely irrelevant. The other extreme of Gnosticism was that because the body was evil, it didn't really matter what you did. So actually the Gnostics would very often, some Gnostics would do pretty much anything they wanted in terms of bodily reality. There was no morality because they didn't see that the body had to be controlled. It was the source of evil, and therefore you just kind of what you were stuck with. What you hoped for is in the next life you'd be without a body. And so you can also see why these two, these two responses, both of which are extreme responses to the early Christians, will find themselves set very much against these two principles. Because one, Christians believe very strongly, and you can find this in the letters of St. Paul, Christians very, very much believe in the importance of being good citizens, being involved in material reality, being involved in politics, being involved in life, being good citizens, as well as that what moral actions are very important. You can read about this in the letter of the Corinthians. In the Ephesians, Galatians, all these things that St. Paul talks about the importance of daily lived out life, the importance of that, as well as that St. John will go to extremes, making sure you understand the importance and the goodness of fleshly reality. That's why he goes so extremely into, in John chapter 6, when he's talking about the Eucharist, when Jesus is giving, he says, he doesn't use what Matthew, Mark, and Luke use when we're referring to the Eucharist. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, when they're talking about the Eucharist, with Jesus' words, Jesus always uses the word soma which means body. But John uses the words flesh so that there's no confusion that actually that God took on flesh. Because he doesn't want you to think that just an angel came down to make all of us angels. 
It's actually why St. Thomas, again, people who think that you'd become an angel when you die, is not, that's not, that's not, that's not our, what our, we believe. We don't believe that we became angels. We, became, we believe that you were given a resurrected <laughs> body because the body is a way in which you can encounter God. It's not something where it's actually your body prohibits you from encountering God, which is what the Gnostics thought. You can actually experience God through the lens of your body. It's also why the importance of, in the early church, why the sacraments, even to this day, why the sacraments have a bodily reality to them, a material reality. You can feel them, you can smell them, you can touch them, you can taste them. Why? Because in our senses, our sensual appetites, although they can lead to sin, our sensual appetites are actually ways in which we can experience God. It's also why you can see God and experience God in nature and things like this. Does this make sense? So this notion of body and spirit, or what was sometimes people thought about being a duality between body and spirit, the early Christians are going to le veer very much against that, even to the point where especially you're going to see it develop over time, people are going to un understand that no, the body is good, and they will reject Gnosticism. And this is pretty much the first thing which the early church encounters, because it's one of the most predominant philosophies of the day, as well as philosophy being a daily way in which people lived out their life and justify their actions. Because usually in the way in which we justify our actions, people go and, and speak to a higher law. This was for many people in Greece. And so this is what the early Christians will come into conflict with. The second main thing which the Christians will come into conflict with is finally in the 300s when Christianity becomes legal, you can become and practice your faith openly, whereas that before 313, you couldn't practice the faith openly because it was illegal to be Christian. After 313, when Constantine wins the Battle of uh, Milvian Bridge and proclaims the Edict of Milan, which legalizes um, religious tolerance throughout the empire, is that what will happen is that therefore it becomes okay to be Christian, okay to bring it into practice, it also becomes popular. So the second thing, the second major thing that happens therefore in the church, especially as you have mass influx of many people who had not been Christian, because when the early Christians, it was, very, it was very dangerous to become a Christian. But after 313, it actually becomes okay to be Christian. And there's even sometimes some benefits to being Christian. Because the emperor definitely is pro-Christian. People who want to get in good with the emperor will become <coughs> Christian. And actually, Constantine starts pouring money into the church to, and to start building up and to taking care of things. And so people want advantage of the money. So you're going to have a great influx of a lot of people who are not necessarily trained highly in the faith. But they just kind of said, okay, I'll accept baptism and things like that. So, but when they start talking about that Jesus is God, a lot of people, the concept that God becomes man, this notion that God takes flesh, becomes something which a lot of the, a lot of the Greek pagans who become Christians, and even it starts infecting leaders in the church. You won't find this notion that Jesus was not God in any of the early church writers. Again, if you look at the Irenaeus, if you look at all the different early church writers during the times of the persecutions, all of those patristic writers are affirming Jesus' divinity and things like this. When you get to this point, though, you'll have that a lot of people will start to deny that Jesus is actually God. They'll say, no, well, why? Because what they're familiar with is their Greek pantheon. And so the notion of what, the God-man, sounds similar to Jesus, the God-man, which is also what they're being told about, this new God, this Christos, who... They've, they've been baptized into. When they talk about talking to God, man, what makes a lot more sense to them is the notion of Hercules, something like this, which is that Hercules was the God man too. He was half God, half man. He was a demigod, which will give rise to when Jesus, they're confronted with the person of Jesus, many people will just consider him to be in the same light as a Hercules type figure, a demiurge is what the term is. They don't believe that Jesus is the demigog, is that he don't believe that Jesus was fully God. That he is what? He is something which is created by God. Created to save us and things like this. And so this notion, which is Jesus really isn't God, will be promoted by a man in the early church who will actually attain the rank of bishop. And his name is, does anyone know? Arius. Arius. Arius will start promoting this and it becomes very popular. Because this is a little bit more easily to understand. I mean, honestly, it is. A demigod which has a long-standing tradition within Roman mythology and Greek mythology and things like this, it's a lot easier to understand than the much more complex understanding of Jesus having two natures and things like this, and so forth and so on. A little bit, this is easier. 
So people who want easy, who want simple, who want, this is easier for them to understand and to grapple with that because to say this, now everyone in the early church was not very happy when this started becoming popular. And actually that's what, why the first council of Nicaea is called in 325 was to answer this question because Christians are breaking out into fights. And this fight actually enters into the council itself when a very famous figure, I love this, this particular meme, better watch out, you better not cry, better not pout, I'm telling you why, Santa Claus is coming to town. <laughs> because Santa Claus, also known as Nicholas of Myra, which was a city just south of Ephesus, uh, will walk up to, uh, will walk up to Arius in the middle of council and punch him in the face. <laughs> and you can actually see, give, uh, here's so, several different means. This, he knows when you're asleep, he knows when you're awake, he knows if you possess the consubstantiator of the son with the father. <laughs> I'm going for all these different, I like this one. I came to give presents to kids and to punch heretics. I just ran out of presents. <laughs> <laughs> so at the council, Nicholas, who had actually been persecuted and had ended up in prison under the reign of Diocletian, that's what a lot of people don't realize. During that, Nicholas, who was the bishop, ended up, in ended up being persecuted for the faith and things like this. He ends up being in prison. So when they come out, he's a renowned figure. And he will basically come out, as many of the, actually the, the traditional leaders of the church will come out, and you'll have this big conflict between what, what will be established at that first council of Nicaea is that no, that Arius is wrong. Arius will be condemned. Arius' position will be condemned as not being the authentic gospel. It's a perversion. It's a false gospel, which actually is what Jesus himself predicted. There will be false shepherds who come to try to deceive and mislead the flock. But now, a lot of people think, again, like, what does it really make a difference? Why does this make a difference? Why is it such a big, huge thing in the early church? Why was it enough that Nicholas felt the need to punch Arius in the face, as well as that people like Athanasius, who was another leader in Alexandria, which is, there was four main centers of Christianity at the time of Nicaea. The first one is in Alexandria in Egypt, which had also been a traditionally Jewish center. If you know anything about Alexandria, Alexandria had been where many Jews are. So anywhere that there was large populations of Jews, you'll also find large populations of Christians. So Alexandria will become one major center of Christianity. Another one will be Antioch in Turkey, over in Rome. And then finally you'll have another one which will eventually be in Istanbul, Constantinople, when Constantine moves the capital. So you'll have major centers. You'll still have some in Jerusalem, but Jerusalem will be burned by the Romans in 70, so you lose a lot of the prominence of Jerusalem, although there will also be some prominence in terms of Jerusalem, those five centers. And actually the leaders of those places, the leaders of those cities will be called the patriarchs. Another name for patriarch is Pope, Papa. So those leaders will become the main persons. And so at the council, of Nicaea, what will be determined, because basically the way in which Arius wants to describe God is in a line, okay? Well, we'll obviously went out, and what most of us are probably familiar with is the notion of what the three equal points of the triangle, which is what they will use, or at least will sub sub subsequently be used. Again, one circle, has everyone, everyone has seen this before? This notion of the Trinity? What, expressing three equal points, three equal distinct points, and yet one thing. This is still I'm not saying that the Trinity is this. Again, this is by way of analogy. This is the best way that we can come and try to grapple with what the early church fathers felt it was so necessary to get by. Versus Arius, who will want to place the Trinity, who will want to place the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit into a line. The Father, the Son, the Spirit. The Father who is superior and over the Son. The Son who is therefore created by the Father and therefore, but it's below the Father, and then below that is somewhere the Spirit, if that makes sense. So this is a very, it seems like just a, a fine point of theology, until you understand the mystery of the Trinity a little bit more fully, the slightly comprehensible, and this is what Mother Teresa uses as whenever we talk about a mystery in our Catholic faith. A mystery is not something which is incomprehensible, because something which is completely incomprehensible is irrelevant. It is only slightly comprehensible. But the little bit that we can understand makes a huge difference. Because any time you speak about God, any time you start talking about especially the nature of God or what God has revealed to us about his nature, it's not that we've come to all of a sudden understand and we discovered this, it was revealed to us. That God himself is the only one who can reveal certain things to us. But the relationship of the Trinity, when you put it into that notion of three equal points and one being, 
you can start to extrapolate and start to talk about various things about God, which if they're true about God, they are also meant to be true about human beings. When human beings deviate from these principles which we know are true about God, we end up in suffering. It's actually why Jesus came to reveal the Trinity to us, to understand that if you can understand the maker, then you can understand the clay a little bit better. You understand the image and likeness of which we have been created, and we understand that, that perfect paint, that perfect image which is God, that perfect one who is God, you can actually understand yourself. And you can actually avoid suffering. Avoid actually at least unnecessary sufferings. The unnecessary sufferings which are consequences of ignorance, of sin, and likewise when we deviate from living out our Trinitarian reality. Does this make sense? Because some of the things that you can say which are true about the Trinity, a very few things. The Trinity is more than these things. But you can say that this is true of Trinitarian reality. That the Trinity is what? Personal. So personal, it's tripersonal. Okay? Personal. Uh, there's persons present within the Trinity, which is also when you're talking about the Trinity, you're talking about love, which is that the, God's deepest nature is revealed in John's letters. God is love. Therefore, love is also these things. So when you talk about love, love is always personal, fully personal. Not just a little bit of the person, not just the select parts that we like, but it's a fully personal. That the God the Father is a person, God the Son is a person, God the Spirit is a person. Therefore, a fully personal reality. And when we start taking elements away from the person, we start eliminating the qualities that we find to be either repugnant, that we find uncomfortable, or the parts that we just don't understand. When we deny those things, it has an effect. Also that we can see that there's a relational element to it. That also, this also means that we who are created in the image and likeness of God, we are built for a relationship, and we are meant to be in relationship, which is why when we find ourselves falling out of relationship due to disunity or due to sin, when we find the relational elements, but there's also qualities to what relationship actually means and entails. And in this relationship, it also means that we are not created to be isolated individuals. If we find ourselves ever in isolation, Lone Mountains, or actually, even to a certain extent, one of the principles of the United States, which many people hold dear, although there's a problem to it if you take it to the extreme, which is what? Rugged individualism. <coughs> the rugged individualism where we can do everything ourselves, we don't need anybody else, or things like this. A person who does that finds himself isolated, alone, and outside of relationship with anything other than themselves. Therefore, what? We have a natural need for community. We have a natural, actually, it got the way that God designed it. not because this was just a nice thing that he decided to add on to his plan, but actually because this is something which reflects he himself. That he is, is constantly in relationship. Does this make sense? Also that you'll find that the unconditional, that the father offers everything of himself unconditionally to the son. The son offers everything unconditionally to the father, which is also why it's reciprocal. That's why we actually use the, this circle. This notion of reciprocal love. That within this, though, there's that the, those three equal points to the triangle denote that despite the differences, which is also interesting because that although there's an equality present, it doesn't mean that there's a sameness. The Father is not the Son, and the Son is not the Father, and the Spirit is not either of them. That there is a difference between the persons of the Trinity, and yet there is a true equality. That we see the principles of both equity and equality, both found within God. Which is also what's going to say that in terms of our actually our relationships which are built upon love, is that we will respect the differences of one another and yet recognize the fundamental reality of the equality that unites us together. It'll also actually take a place in one of the greatest relationships in marriage. The ancient Babylonian, Assyrian, Mesopotamian understanding of marriage was husband over the wife, wife over the child, like this. It's that notion of actually, if you remember Jabba the Hutt. Jabba the Hutt was the, was the primary way in which the Assyrians and the ancient Mesopotamian religions understood marriage. It's actually what the Baal religions were all about. A type of marriage, but a marriage of superiority. That's what Baal means, is husband, but it's a very different definition of husband than the Jews understand the definition of husband, as well as what Jesus will reveal. So what? Because it's not a supremacy of one over the other. But it's what? It's a perfect, despite differences, a perfect equality. And we see that this is actually even in reflection of God himself. God himself has three different persons, yet there is a unity which is present between those persons. You'll also find that in this 
co-equality, unconditional, holding nothing of himself back. The Father offers everything of himself and gives the entirety of himself and also receives the entirety of the Son as the Father as the Son is doing the same thing. And there's not a beginning or an end to it. Both are doing it at the exact same time. There's no beginning or end of God. God is the Alpha and Omega because he's outside of time. Which also leads to what? That because God is outside of time, there's an eternal faithful quality to these things. This is all things you can just take away from if you really reflect upon what actually that Nicene Creed and the subsequent councils that came out really gave us, is that they wanted to understand more fully as well as to define and to separate some of the lies that were coming in to give us a more concrete image of why Jesus came into the world and why the Trinity is so important. Another thing as you'll find is that the individual <coughs> and the individual persons don't ever become a amorphous blob. They retain their individual distinctiveness. And so actually that's why we can also say that certain things in life, when a person loses their individual distinctiveness and becomes co-enmeshed, or another word which, we say in, which people will say in psychology, when you become uh, codependent, things like that, you start losing your individuality and things like that. It's not a healthy, good thing. It's not a good thing. And it's actually not in reflection of God. When people start living for others or they place people above them or things like this, it doesn't work out well because it doesn't reflect the Trinitarian reality by which we're all made. That we also find that Jesus was absolutely humble, had no problem actually coming down and taking flesh, which is what the Greeks had a very hard time accepting. Not only did they have a hard time accepting that God would die for us, but even the notion that God would take flesh was an absurdity to them. St. Paul will actually even refer to this. He'll say, the cross, which is also that the cross has a body on it, is what? It's a stumbling block to the Jews and it's an absurdity to the Gentiles. It makes no sense to them. Because actually the only way in which they understand love, for the most part, is from a self-centered standpoint. Oh, a sinful standpoint. One where they're still bound up by their own ignorance and things like this. You'll find, though, that Jesus has no problem humbling himself and lowering himself down for the sake of love. Because some people are like, it makes no sense that God would become man. That's too humble. But actually we see that humility lies at the heart of God. God himself is humble. That's why he actually wants us to be humble. But humility is finding a balance. Humility is not going to one extreme or the other. It's finding the balance of seeing ourselves as we truly are. That Jesus was also obedient. We find that obedience, which the only thing which can be obedient is something which has free will. Jesus was absolutely obedient to the will of the Father. So a thing which has free will can choose to be obedient. Something without free will isn't obedient. It's only something which has free will has the capacity to be obedient, which is why free will also is something which resides within the heart of God himself. That is something which we experience and he has offered to us as a participation within his own being, is that he himself is free. He didn't have to make us. He wasn't caused by some external factor that he desired in freedom to share his life with us, which is also why he will want us to experience obedience because he wants us to experience freedom, but he also wants to experience obedience because only through obedience do we find freedom. People who think that they can find freedom apart from obedience will never find freedom. Because obedience, just as husbands and wives are called to be mutually obedient one to the other, in that obedience of submitting their will to the will of the other, not trying to force the other person to become like them, but trying to become like their spouse, they actually find in that mutual obedience, they find a freedom. As well as they find actually a satisfaction of the deepest desires of the heart. And then it will finally be, again, a perpetual sacrifice, which we usually call sacrifice if you take away the selfish, you only offer a sacrifice when you don't want to offer it. If you want to offer it, it's called, does anyone know? Gift. Constant gift. A gift of yourself. And that's actually one of the most ancient titles for God is as the gift giver. These are all things that you can pull out and extrapolate just from those first councils of the church, which we're talking about what is actually, because I can tell you this, if you live this out in relationships, this makes a big, huge difference in daily life. It makes a huge difference. And you can pull all of this from just the understanding of what comes to us from that notion of the Trinity. Just making sense? Yes. When you find... Well, what you'll find, again, when you look at the word agape, which I was about to get to agape, uh, yes, our humanity naturally see, needs this and desires this, 
But this is also meant to be experienced through the lens of the other loves as well. Uh, philia, actually, philia, which works, is experienced through the lens of agape. Uh, eros, which works, is experienced through the lens of agape. So, uh, all of the three of the different loves, if they're experienced in agape, they don't have to be experienced in agape, which all that agape, basically, when you understand it, is other-centered love. So you care more about the other than you care about yourself. You can care more about, that's why actually a lot of people, it's, it's really hard to talk about actually an image of something which is pure agape. It's hard for us to actually talk about something because I can't give you, I can give you images of Eros, I can give you images of Storge, I can give you images of Philia. It's very hard for me to give you an image of agape, if that makes sense. But you can, I can give you images of Eros lived out through agape. I can give you images, I can also give you images of Eros not lived out in agape. I can give you images of Philia, which is lived out in agape. I can also give it to you not lived out in agape. As well as with Storge, I can give you all three of those lived out either, either with agape or against agape. Because agape is other-centered love. He who, he, the greatest form of love, Jesus says, is what? He who lays down his life for his friends. And we see that what? Jesus came to reconcile us to the face of the Father, so we become children of the Father. And we'll find that what Jesus did all of these things. So when you experience actually all of these things, yes, it is agape. <laughs> um, and actually, if you have two people who are experiencing these things, when you actually have both, not just one sided, because you can have a agape, which is one sided. God has agape for us because this is the way that God loves us, actually, and offers himself to us. He offers himself to us in agape. We oftentimes don't return it. And therefore, it's not reciprocal when it comes, from, when it comes at us from God. But actually, if you do, if you were to have it to have two persons, I would say one way of understanding the, actually this word, which is in Greek, is kenosis. These, when you have two people who are entering into agape, or two persons entering into agape, the other, it becomes what's called kenotic, kenosis love, which is a complete emptying. The image of kenosis is the jar which is constantly being poured out but never runs dry. Similar to actually, if you go back to Elijah and the widow, in the book of Kings, the jar which is constantly being poured out but never runs dry, which is a sign of God's love. Now you can also find that within canonic love, see actually not every relationship is actually can be that. There's only two relationships that we can experience in this life which can actually be fully canonic, and that's the relationship of marriage, and that's the relationship of holy orders. Those are the two actually pathways, which is why these two things are cannot, are pathways toward, now that doesn't mean that every relationship of marriage will be canonic. It also doesn't mean that every priest will also live in canonic love. But these are actually pathways and actually ways in which you can actually find kenosis. Because if you have kenosis, it can lead to another word which is called theosis, which is called divinization. Because there's agape, I'd say, which leads to kenosis. Kenosis leads to theosis. Theosis, which is the divinization where we become like God. That's what it's actually Athanasius in the 300 said. He said, God became man to make man God. Which, to make man God, that's the process by which man is made. God is called theosis. And it's done through the lens of kenosis. If that makes sense. So when looking, it's also why vocations which you try to, to sever and divorce various vocations, it's also why it entails grave serious sin. Because part of it is that you have broken the faithful notion which is present always within what canonic love is always meant to be. It's also why the human family, naturally speaking, and this is something which Pope Francis recently uh, referred to, but this is not just Pope Francis, this goes to many different church fathers, is that the greatest icon, a lot of times when people try to understand the Trinity, hold up like St. Patrick's shamrock, let's say three and one. Well, bloody sh I love shamrocks, but they don't tell me anything about God. <laughs> Okay, which is why the greatest image of God in the world today is not the human person, but it's the human family. The healthy human family is, actually that's what it is referred to in the church documents as the icon of God, the living icon of God present in the world today. We oftentimes look outside of ourselves and we look outside of community, outside of things like that, trying to try to find some way of understanding God abstractly out in the outside world, when actually the greatest image of God is we ourselves if we are united. And this starts actually in the family. That's why the family is the icon of the Trinity. Because in the family, you can experience all these things. So Jesus, again, the notion, this notion of God becoming man, as well as joining man to God, 
at God's design and plan for humanity, there still has, was rebuffs. And there's always been people who, have, ever since the very beginning, have always rebuffed and have found that this doesn't make sense or whatever, for whatever reasons. And Arianism doesn't just stop. Now, Arianism will actually eventually be crushed. And one of the reasons that we'll get to in a second why it's crushed, <coughs> Nicholas will stand up against, again, the Council of Nicaea will condemn Arianism. Later on, you'll find, though, that actually a good chunk of the Christian world, especially when barbarians start moving, many of the Goths and the Visigoths and the Vandals from the barbarian tribes will all, all convert to Arian Christianity. The reason for Arian Christianity actually pretty much being annihilated and dissolved is that they'll get caught bet between three different forces politically because they'll all end up in southern in Africa and they'll all end up in Italy and Spain, which means that actually when the Muslims actually give rise in the 5th and 6th centuries, or in the 6th and 7th centuries, you'll find the rise of Islam is that they'll come, the first persons who actually Islam will crush will be those Aryan Christians. Because they'll be crushed from the south by the Muslims, they'll be crushed from the east by the Byzantines, and they'll actually be crushed from the north, and they'll kind of get boxed in by all from the Franks, the Frankish, who are Nicene Christians. Therefore, you'll see the end of, of Arianism at that point, when finally the last of the tribes are pretty much crushed and annihilated in those kind of that, that, uh, that pincer, just that history has shown us. But you'll also find that the notion of God, this is still something which is still present actually because you can, um, in the world today, because you can actually say that Mormonism, the Mormons are actually an evolution, a modern day adaptation of Arianism because this is the notion of, of, Arian, of what Mormons believe about Jesus. This is why many people won't consider Mormons to be Christians because Mormons don't believe that Jesus is equal to the Father. They believe that he is what that he is the first among all of us, but he's not equal. He was created by God, or at least that there was, again, the Mormon, Mormon religion is a little bit complex. Um, but generally speaking, actually, their notion of God, as well as man's place in his plan, is they understand that God the Father, then you have below that, but not equal to the Father, is the Son, Jesus, of who all of us can be raised up to that level, but not to above that. So this ancient, actually, understanding of the demiurge, that's why they'll also say that the priestly authority died with the apostles for 1,800 years until it was given back. But you go to the early church, and during this whole time in the early church, you're going to have two main schools of thought that's coming and developing, especially at the time prior to Diocletian and just after it. Two main schools, which will be in Alexandria, which is where St. Mark, if you know anything about St. Mark, St. Mark was a disciple of Peter, and Mark will be sent out to Alexandria in Egypt, and he'll become the leader of the church in Alexandria. This will become one of the main centers of Christianity. It's also where the Gospel of Mark comes from. The second area will be in Antioch. And so actually what will happen is during the three and four hundreds, you're going to have the, you're going to have the development, especially as now there's peacefulness and there's things like this, and Christianity can now flourish. You're going to have two main schools of intellectual thought, which are going to develop during this time. And it's actually it already developed during the time um, even during the time of the persecutions, but it will especially develop during this time, is Alexandria and Antioch will develop. These two schools of thought. So during this time, you'll also find this is, their understandings of Christ will differ just slightly. People from Antioch, you'll have names like Tertullian or um, Origen or things like this, the schools of Antioch and Alexandria. If you've heard the names Tertullian, Origen, Athanasius, all these different people come from these two various schools. Um, so when you look and get to this, their understanding of Christ will be just slightly different. Not too different, but they'll be just slightly different. Then you'll have, after the council, you're going to have this man by the name of Nestorius. Nestorius will be actually the bishop of Constantinople. And if you look at Constantinople, it's right there on the straits. It's up on the upper, my, this side, left side. Nestorius. Nestorius also has a friend <laughs> who's the bishop of Antioch. His name is John. And Nestorius starts promoting that, you know what, Mary is, can't be the mother of God, which was actually a title. He disagrees with this title, which had been used for a long period of time. And actually his friend John will say, you need to really shut up. <laughs> He'll say that you're pissing off everyone in the empire. He's like, I understand what you're saying, because they actually went to school together. <laughs> They both taught in Antioch together, and eventually Nestorius will be promoted. He'll be made the patriarch, the pope of Constantinople. And all of a sudden when he's made this, and he starts just preaching the way he always has, is that one of the things he always had a difficulty with, which was not a dogma at the time, was the notion of Mary being mother of God. And he didn't really believe it. 
He didn't believe it because he had, was very intellectual and he had an intellectual way of approaching the natures of Christ and things like that. But actually, when he starts preaching, is that Nestorius will start doing things which he doesn't really even think anything about because he'd done it publicly for years in the school system in Antioch and things like this. And then all of a sudden, but people who are from the east, from the west, will start hearing this and they'll start flipping out. And they actually go back to Rome and they report to the Pope and they go back to Alexandria and they report to this man by the name of Cyril. Cyril of Alexandria. And Cyril of Alexandria will go nuts. <laughs> Not nuts, but he, he most certainly disagrees very, very strongly because it's not the notion of anything about Mary that Nestorius has a problem with. What Nestorius has a problem with is the understanding of the two natures of Jesus Christ. The two natures of Jesus Christ, his divine nature and his human nature. And so Nestorius has this understanding that, okay, you know what? The divine nature of Jesus, his divine nature, is something which is totally different than the human nature. It's almost he actually creates a division in the person of Christ in his own mind, the way he understands. It. He says, okay, Jesus' divine nature was always present. His human nature was created. And so there's not, it doesn't be, it's not the same thing. You have to separate them. There's, not two, there's two natures, two natures, and yet two natures which are distinct and separable and not from that. And he, again, it seems like a, a nuance, but what he creates is a division in the person of Christ. He creates disunity in the source of unity, if that makes sense. And so John, who understands some of the nuances, will actually tell him, he'll say, and actually the Pope will send a letter saying, you have 10 days to recant or you're excommunicated. And this is also the Bishop of Antioch. If you understand who this is today, this is the equivalent, if you know, have you ever seen these guys? These are the two modern day patriarchs. This is not John of Antioch. This is the modern day patriarch of Antioch. And this is actually, uh, the modern day patriarch of Constantinople, who actually is very close today with Pope Francis and Pope Benedict. He was very good friends with Pope Benedict. And there's been a lot of talk between the two of them on the reunification between the Eastern Orthodox Church and the, and the Latin West. But at this time is that Nestorius is the Bishop of Constantinople and when all of a sudden these things start being publicly proclaimed, which was kind of an intellectual nuance at the time, where he starts denying and he creates a divided Christ where he's a, human nature is totally separate from his divine nature. You'll then find, if this is an early one, which some people will say, this was called monophysite, is the human nature kind of had a little piece of the divine but wasn't fully divine. Then he'll just say, they're, they're just totally separate. What will actually become the, the teachings of the church, both which is held by East and West, will be that Jesus has two natures in one person. Um, but what will happen is that you will have figures you will actually have from Ephesus, from where St. John comes, you'll have a guy by the name of Memnon. You'll have Peter, the successor of Peter, who was the name is uh, Celestius. And then you'll have Cyril, who will all come out at Cyril and Alexandria, all of whom will start getting very, very upset because they're basically saying, you're not teaching the authentic faith. So what will happen, <clears throat> this is the modern day um, patriarch of uh, the Coptic Church. You'll find obviously our own Francis, who will have things to say about it, and then uh, the Bishop of Ephesus. So, and you'll still see that these <laughs> figures still exist in the world today. And usually, actually, when we hold councils, it will be councils of all the bishops in the church, including these figures. Um, because we separated in schism, these figures have not, for the most part, many of them have not been participating within the councils that we've had. They just held their first council. Um, just actually last year, I believe it was, and because they recognize they can't hold a council unless they have all the people together. Um, so there's a lot of problems with that, but we're still having still have that. So when the, what actually ha came out of that council, because what was being talked about was not so much Mary and her identity, but it was about Jesus' divine natures. It was about Jesus being one person with two natures, which are inseparable. You can't separate them. Again, it might seem like a nuance of theology, but it will make an implication on Mary because actually that's what Nestorius goes after. He goes after the title of Theotokos. He goes after Mary by trying to say, well, Mary is the mother of Jesus in his human nature, but he's not the mother of Jesus in the divine nature. She's only the mother of half of Jesus, if that makes sense. She's only the mother of half. So I'll, I'll grant you that 
Mary, Mary is the mother of half of Jesus, the half, the human half, but not the divine half. The divine half, no, that she can't be the mother of that. And that's where you'll find the Pope, you'll find uh, Alexandria, as well as you'll find those other ones who will come in. They'll meet at the Council of Ephesus, and the Council of Ephesus will not turn out well for Nestorius. Uh, Nestorius will actually be condemned, and John, John of Antioch will actually show up late. So many people you know, think that he showed up late because he knew that, it was, that he was going to be condemned. He didn't want his friend, he didn't want to be present when his friend was condemned. Um, Nestorius will eventually, again, have a lot of problems in the church, but this notion of Mary as mother of God will come out as a result of this because when a mother gives birth, she is the mother, as we know, of a person. You're not the mother of a nature. So I know Irene has children. I know many of you have children. I know some of them. Again, you're the mother of that person. You're not just parts of them. Because that state that starts to create divisions, separations, and unity. It also starts to create separations in our relationships, if that makes sense. Starting to deny elements in which we truly are connected one to another, especially when you start denying roles, relationships, as well as identity. Because we'll see that roles actually are fundamental parts of who we are as human beings. This makes sense. And Mary's role is inseparable from her identity, just as Jesus' natures are inseparable from who he is. Does this make sense? So in Mary, again, Jesus is a person with two natures, a human nature, a divine nature, which is also why in his human nature he can act as the new Adam. In his divine, act, in his divine nature he acts as God, and he is God, and therefore his actions happen outside of time. His actions and his humanity will happen within time. And so you'll find this very this, this paradox, which doesn't seem to make sense for human brains. But it doesn't make sense to human brains only because we are bound currently to time. We can't see the big picture. But actually this notion of what's being talked about this time, you're going to find lots of different thinkers who are talking about the Trinitarian reality as well as the natures of Christ, trying to understand not just these abstract thoughts, but how do we understand ourselves? How do we understand the way in which we relate one to another? And so, in this, it's referred to as the hypostatic union. Mary is rightfully called Mother of God. This will come out of the Council because the Mother of the Jesus is a person with two natures. She does not create his divine nature, but she does supply for his human nature. But she still, what? She still bears and is the mother of both. Therefore, this is the Council. With, if you've ever seen this picture before, this is what's called Christ Penacrito, is the image which you'll have Jesus, with kind of the droopy side, which actually shows the humanity. And then you'll find with the clear side, which is trying to show his divinity. So they tried to do an art. Obviously, an art make, makes it kind of look a little bit ridiculous. Yeah, yeah you see? You always thought he just had kind of a droop. He got, like, punched in the eye or something. No. It's meant to display the humanity. It's also why he's holding two fingers up. He's holding two fingers up to show his two natures in one being. Also why he's holding the scriptures. He is the word. The word which was present before Jesus came into human history, but that he's always present. He's always been present because he is the word of God, the word spoken in Genesis, as well as the word which is mentioned in the book of John, um, that he is found. And that's why Jesus is holding the word. He's holding the two natures. You'll find this. You'll find the cross. And so this is what, again, in iconography, you'll find a lot of actually theology was put into iconography to try to teach people these realities. Now, for the most part, the finer points of the theology don't seem to make that big of a difference. But if you start denying that Mary is the mother of God, the next thing that you start denying is that Mary is the mother of us, that she has any type of role, any type of function, any type of thing. You start creating divisions, separations, which as we've seen from the last class is part of one of God's designs for humanity is to be united and joined together. Does this make sense? So, in 431... Mary relates in that archetypal way in which she acts for us, and everything which is true about Mary can potentially be true of us, because Mary does act as the mother of Jesus, but also as the new Eve, who's called to be in friendship and be the friend of God as disciple. You'll find that she is the first among those in the church, and therefore is called to be a spouse to God and find that relationship with him um, in terms of that, as well as that she is the daughter of the Father, just as all of us are children of God, because all of us are called to be actually, in a very serious sense, all of us are called, a mother is one who bears a, bears a child, is united to him and transformed. Every mother who takes a child into her womb, as I'm, I mean, I, can, I can't say this from experience, but from the women in the room, you know, 
I mean, at least I can see, I can see and know it's true, although I've not experienced it, that women are changed fundamentally by carrying children. There's a bond, a relationship which is, which is chained. When they carry children within them for long periods of time, is that what they are changed fundamentally. Again, and this is actually creates one of the strongest bonds which the world has ever seen, which is the maternal bond, where they truly become mothers. But see, what is also true, although we are not called to necessarily become mothers the way in which Mary, in her distinctive way, is the mother of God, we are called, and all of us become true Christ bearers. We bear Christ within our own bodies. Every time that we receive the Eucharist, Mary's identity as the mother, actually we participate in a, in a fashion form within that because we become Christ bearers, who Christ comes into our body. And that's actually what we believe in terms of our theology. Every time that we receive the Eucharist into us, we become impregnated with the word and we are meant to be fundamentally transformed and changed. Not that we ever actually change, we never metamorphosis into something other than ourselves. But we are, we what? We become who we actually are, we're always meant to be. And the Eucharist is one of the primary ways in which we do this because it's one of the primary ways in which we become Christ bearers. Does this make sense? Also, you'll find what? In that espousal, that again, being that means that we become members of the church, which is also actually fully initiated members of the church, which are united in communion, communal union. We believe that in the Eucharist that the Eucharist is the highest form of unity which exists in the cosmos. Because in that we participate within the unity of God, within the being of God. We are drawn into unity with God. Actually, it's, it's a conjugal act which super exceeds the conjugal act between spouses. Because in the Eucharist we truly become what? In communion, unified by the Spirit, to God and become Christ bearers and we're called to what? To go forth and to spread the gospel, to go forth and bear life. As well as all of us find that unity which is found amongst all of ourselves as true brothers and sisters in Christ, we all become sons and daughters of God, unified as a single human family, as the bride of God, as friends of God. Does this make sense? So, God revealed about himself, again, all these images, when you look back to all of these images that we've even used in the Trinity, even some of the better ones, are not really good enough. And these don't really describe what the early church fathers were trying to get at in terms of defining and understanding God. So when you look at this, again, this actually, someone broke down and actually did the two pictures, how it would look if it was just one. You'll find kind of what looks like kind of drugged up Jesus on the right in the human nature versus the divine in the center, but therefore you have what? The meeting of man and God in the figure of Christ. The main point of the Council of Ephesus, yes, the Council of Ephesus affirmed Mary's being the mother of God, but it was the notion of the hypostatic union as well as these nature of the real nature of Christ in being the connective force which unites God to man and being that which unifies us to God so that we can actually find what truly satisfies. And that these two things, humanity and God, are not because a lot of people want to separate them. A lot of people say they can't be combined. These two things can, and actually God's design for us is to be intertwined with him. And this doesn't make sense to us because we're looking at something outside which super exceeds our ability to comprehend it currently. It's also why St. Paul says, eye has not seen, ear has not heard what God has prepared for those who love him. Um, and so therefore, Mary being the mother of God is a natural way, a natural way in which we protect and you'll see again Mary protecting the identity of Jesus as well as Jesus protecting the identity of Mary as the new Adam, the new Eve. You'll find that this is a natural extension of who and we are all called to be as well as a way in which we are all called to understand our identity as members of the church. Any questions? Next week we'll come back to Professor uh, You know, there's a lot of things in theology that are sort of obscure. Yes. But I wonder how this how this disagreement started because the scripture is pretty clear about this. Mary, you shall conceive the Holy Spirit, right? I mean, it was yeah. This was so obvious. Yeah, but it is it is obvious. But then you you have all these different stories from like mythology, and you have especially from the Greek the Greek mythology and things like that. People are coming in and saying, well, the Greek gods they they took on the appearance of they took on the appearance. That was another one I believe that was called a uh, Polinarianism, if I remember correctly. So this is a sort of a contamination of the scripture by cultural forces. Yeah, okay. yeah, because you'll find, and you'll find that a lot, because 
the notion that the whole thing that people are constantly trying to reject is this intertwining between man and God. Is the intertwining people will always be trying to pull apart, whether it be to one extreme or to the opposite. Because this will be one where they're trying to pull away, because then you have the opposite extreme where they're trying to say, okay, well, Jesus is God. He's not human. Because the other dogmas you're going to talk about are harder. I mean, they're not quite so transparent. This one's easy. Yeah, well, it's, it seems to be, but you still, you still have people. I, I mean, I was talking, but I was, I was talking to a Calvinist, uh, not to, I mean, what was it, um, maybe about 18 months ago, I was out to dinner with some friends and very strict Calvinist, and he, he denied, he said Mary is not, I mean, he, he outright denied, he's, and he would, not, he would not assent to Mary being the mother of God. He actually denied the Theotokos. I don't think that all Calvinists do that, but I know that he... I know for a fact. Yeah, so I don't know, but I was just talking to him, and I mean, he was pretty rigid in many of the things, but he, I mean, I was, I was talking to him, and I brought up a lot of the scriptures, and he was like, oh, and he had a way of, of trying to answer all that, and the same thing was true with, at the time of, like, Nestorius, Nestorius, who was very intellectual, very highly trained academically, and I mean, you got starting into this language of, like, noose, and so forth and so on, but, but no, the, the scriptures are, are clear, yeah, I would agree. Any other questions? Yes. <clears throat> I, I understand what this gentleman has said, and I'm trying to, to, to go along with this. Coming from a Protestant background, that's, mm -hmm. that's where I'm that's coming from. Yeah. Um, I take it more on my faith, because, and I can get to a certain point, but when my daughter was raised Protestant, as I raised her Methodist, and she confronts me with this, all I can say is I can get to a certain point where my brain, my human brain, will accept certain things. And you've explained a little more to me tonight than what I knew before. Uh, but but I still have a hard time getting it to, to, to mesh yet because this is very new to me. Sure. So, uh, and putting it in words, I'm at a loss for it. Kind of. But it's not quite as clear to me. As, I mean, I take it at face value because I believe the Word of God. Yeah. So, okay. But I'm still a little lost. Oh, yeah. Well, that, well, that's what you'll also find in the church, with the Catholic Church especially. You're going to find that the Catholic Church, if you want to accept it by faith, that's fine. I mean, that's great. And then some people have that. Some people, though, want to know, and some people want to understand. Well, I, I yeah. Know, but I haven't quite gotten there yet. So yeah. So, so there's also the notion that for, I mean, but that's where the church allows and actually encourages people, because that's where we say that if you grow in the understanding as well, that's another way in which we can connect to God, although it's not absolutely necessary. I know, I mean, Actually, most of, a lot of faithful people who don't aren't concerned with the finer the finer points of theology, um, probably more, much more faithful than I. <laughs> but uh, there's a certain point where the church encourages. That's why we, we talk about faith and reason that you can use both to encounter God within faith and reason. Um, and that there's ways of and that's what they that's what they were doing at the time in the early church, especially was using especially <coughs> Greek philosophy to try to understand it. But that, that is even a limitation, though, in philosophy, and that's what happened with Nestorius. Nestorius, who was very familiar with Greek philosophy, got so intertwined with the Greek philosophy, is that, and likewise, his system, his, his Greek philosophical system didn't allow for this type of thought. And because it didn't allow for that type of thought, that's where he got himself in trouble. It's because then he said, well, therefore, it cannot be true. <laughs> that's, that's when Cyril of Alexandria, and that's when the Pope, and that's they're like, no, this has, one, been revealed, and two, you just don't understand it. We don't understand enough. And that's why, subsequently, we've, we've developed a theology to actually have an understanding, because, actually, like, like was said, this is, I mean, this one's probably one of the easier. This is one of the easier of the doc. Of, out, out of the dogmas, this is one of the easier, if not the easiest of them, when you get to that. Yeah. Yes, the whole notion of, of human beings giving birth to God is where it trips, it, it trips up. Being that's where actually, but that's where a lot of that's also talking about in terms of the humility, and going back to that notion of humility, which you'll find in Philippians two, um, that God did not deem equality God something to grasp around him, took the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, he humbled himself, and this notion of abject humility, which we naturally speaking repulse away from. Why would God take become human, that, that, that's that utter humility, which you can also say is what Adam and Eve rejected <laughs> in the garden with pride and things like that. Yeah? Uh, it's like in John chapter 3 when Nicodemus came to Jesus at night and Jesus said, you must be born again. And he said, well, I have to go back to my mother's womb. He said, no. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> you know, you're a master of you know what I'm talking about. 
Mm -hmm. And even in Genesis, Eve was told she was the, to be the mother of all living. Mm -hmm. So it goes all the way back to when the woman was first created, God's plan, to where it would be this way. And even when I was in Catholic school, the priest said, the church is really called Holy Mother, the church, because a mother nourishes her children. Yep. Didn't do very well with me growing up, you know, but... Oh, sure. That was the point. You know, I said, well, I, I don't know about yeah. I'll stay around for some more questions. I know some people are going to go to Mass, so let's go ahead and go and close in prayer. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to come together tonight. We ask you, Lord, to continue to lead and guide us in greater into an encounter with you, with your love and your mercy. And we ask you, Lord, to keep us safe as we go our way. We ask us to help us to see where you're showing us to share your love with all those whom we meet especially as Mary did, and as we are called to do ourselves as your disciples, your bride. We ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen.